being on the pro tour, um, you get a lot of insider information. So it's just kind of been, um, whenever somebody asks your opinion of it, you just got to keep your mouth shut. You know, the first thing that pops into my head, uh, I would love to start playing disc golf courses again, instead of playing these temp courses on golf courses. The Onyx, the Onyx has been pushed out of the bag just before the Champions Cup in 2022. Um, I found the Bonsai. And honestly, it's, it's kind of scary because I can't see myself doing anything besides this. Hey everyone, it's Greg from Six Sided Discs and welcome to All Six Sides, our podcast where we explore the world of disc golf from every angle. Today, we're talking to Team Discraft's Chris Dickerson. Chris is currently tied for eighth highest rated player in the world, a United States champion, two-time disc golf pro tour champion, Champions Cup champion, and many more. Chris, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's great to see you again. Uh, I saw you briefly at Idlewild, uh, Deglo a couple years ago, and we uh, have a video up on our channel from when we threw with you down in Tennessee. Uh, so what have you been up to this off season? Uh, a lot of practicing, actually. There, there's been a lot, the little bit of weather in the last week or so that has kind of kept me indoors. But uh, besides that, I've been out and practicing. I've been going to the gym and uh, getting ready for this coming season. The 2024 season, of course, is fast approaching. We're just about at the end of February here. I know we've had uh, that sort of flurry of off-season announcements. Uh, what have you made of some of the moves that are going on? Uh, Gannon, Burr, Eagle, big news in the off-season. Um, I mean, <clears throat> being on the Pro Tour, um, you get a lot of insider information. So it's just kind of been um, whenever somebody asks your opinion of it, you just got to keep your mouth shut. And uh, either that or lead them in the wrong direction. <laughs> right. Oh, right. I, I didn't know that. Um, yeah. So I, I knew uh, a good amount of where most people were going this off season besides uh, Nicholas. Okay. Um, which I don't, I don't know if his post was an actual goodbye post and then <laughs> something happened uh, that they kept him or uh, if he was just making a post that said, thanks, uh, Discmania for everything you've done. And it just sounded like he was leaving. <laughs> but I mean, I know more than uh, just me uh, have thought that because I've talked to a few people about it and they've asked me where he's going. And I was like, I don't know. I have no clue. I think I saw <laughs> that he did an interview with like a, a Finnish news outlet or website maybe. And they asked him about it and he essentially said that it was sort of a joke, like to maybe drum up publicity. And then it was just okay. him getting promoted to the sky team. And then <laughs> some people were debating online if maybe that was really true or not, you know, and if, if it was just to drum up some press, Hey, it, it worked. Everybody was talking about it. Right. <clears throat> yeah. That's uh, that's the thing during the off season, people want to talk about uh, if someone's contract is up, where they're going, if they're leaving um, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's an exciting uh, part of disc golf. Certainly something new that maybe wasn't around in, in years past, or at least not as much. Yep. So you've been preparing a lot for 2024, but I want to look back and talk a little bit about 2023. Uh, in 2023, you had seven top 10 finishes, three podium finishes, including at D-Glow, Music City Open, as well as your local Tennessee State Championships. But for the first time since 2018, you didn't pick up an Elite Series uh, victory or a major win. Uh, is as you look back on 2023, how would you rate the season as a whole? How do you feel it went overall? Uh, overall, not great. Uh, not, not what I would want to do, um, for a season, but I will say with that, um, uh, I learned a lot from it. I learned how to, you know, um, be behind most of the tournament and how to deal with that. I've learned how to uh, miss cash last season um, at, mm. at Maple Hill. Uh, I did it the year before, so, I mean, it was nothing new there. But it was just like uh, I wasn't doing great the entire season or most of the season. And then uh, coming up on Maple Hill, uh, I missed cash, and I really wasn't happy about that. And then – the last event, the Pro Tour Championship, uh, I slipped on one of the tee pads and I hurt my hip. Uh, so that was mm. kind of, you know, the, the 
icing on top of the cake, you know, for the for the whole season. Just felt like it wasn't going great, and then I had that happen uh, the last tournament. But um, like I said, I, I learned from it, and I really wanted to um, – where the Pro Tour finale did the new format where they took uh, the first two rounds. Uh, that happened the first round. The The slip happened the first round. And I really mm-hmm. wanted to be able to get back out and play the second round, whether or not I was going to play good or not, um, just to uh, finish out the season, basically, instead of just dropping out. Yeah. So um, learned, learned a lot from that, and I'm glad that I was able to do that. Um, with a little bit of, uh, what is it? It was like spray on, uh, numbing stuff. And, uh, yeah, it's the, the magic spray. You see the soccer players, uh, you know, they take a knock or something and they put a little spray on, I get back out there. You'll be all right. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, 2023 was a lot about learning and, uh, I did learn a lot from it. Do you feel like there was anything specific, um, about 2023, like, was it, was it as much about you as it was about maybe the field? I think we saw, you know, more chase card champions than ever before. We saw even like somebody winning from third card, uh, more new winners than ever, ever before. Was there something else going on in, you know, like the, the player base at large, or do you feel like it was more internalized? Is that something you kind of just look at yourself and say, what could I have done differently? Honestly, uh, I'm going to say both. Uh, last season, I think, was the first season that we really saw more people than ever before uh, kind of clumping up at the top and the mid of the pack um, instead of just, you know, somewhere around midway. Um, so the more people that shoot higher, even if they are tying other people, that that makes it a little bit tougher. Um, so the whole field last year, for the most part, uh, step their game up. So that was part of it. And all I needed to do was just, you know, step my game up a little bit, but, um, a couple things here and there, uh, some like smaller nagging injuries and, uh, really kind of messed up my form somewhere throughout the year. And it just, mm. it never got better throughout the year, but, uh, practicing this off season, Got it where I want it. So can't wait for the season to start, the 2024 season. I couldn't agree with you more there. Really looking forward to the new season getting underway. We'll talk a little bit about your kind of how you're looking ahead to the season. Uh, there's been a few changes in the schedule, but I also want to talk a little bit about uh, what you're throwing. So when we had the opportunity to come down and meet you and record with you in Morristown a couple of years ago, I think it was almost exactly two years ago. Uh, this was just after you signed for Discraft, and you told us a little bit about some of the first discs that were making your bag as you were sort of learning those initially. Uh, and you were talking about putting with the Challenger OS, uh, Bag in a Zone, Buzz, Undertaker, Captain's Raptor, Onyx, and Force. How much has your bag evolved over the last two years? Are there any of those molds that have been forced out by something new? Uh, or or something that surprised you along the way? Uh, for the most part, it's uh, basically the same. Just uh, the staples, like the force, the zone, the buzz. Um, Captain Drafter's in there just because you need a really overstable utility disc. Yeah. Uh, the Onyx. The Onyx has been pushed out of the bag because just before the Champions Cup in 2022, um, I found the Bonsai. And oh, yeah, I really like the bonsai. Um, it's a similar speed. I think it's a little bit slower and it says it's a little more overstable, but it it flies great. Does that fit sort of like that, like uh, slightly overstable fairway driver just for like accurate placement shots? Mm hmm. Yep. Uh, fairway driver that still, you can get a lot of distance on it. And actually the last round of this champions cup in 2022, um, there were some gaps in the woods that I didn't really want to lean on throwing a full power driver. So I just mm. down to that and I threw it in the same place and, uh, where it has good stability, I was able to throw uh, flex lines with it, get it to flip up and fly straight. And, uh, 
yeah, that way I could be a little more accurate in the woods. That's really interesting. It, I, I, I think a lot of people tend to forget that Discraft players can bag a, a disc or two from DGA. So that's a, that's a sneaky one, not one that I would have predicted. Um, I'm also curious, how, did you dabble with any of the newer molds that Discraft has put out, like the Zone OS, the Cicada, the Athena, or the Venom? Yeah, um, I've tried all of those. The The Zone OS, it's, it's just not a disc for me. Um, it, it seems like the harder, or at least for me, the test ones we got, it seemed like the harder that you threw it, the more overstable it was, which doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But, <laughs> um, yeah, it, it was just really hard to get to the par threes that we're used to on the Pro Tour. Right. Um, where if they're around 300 feet, uh, most of the time I was coming up decently short trying to yeah. throw it that hard. So it, it didn't make the bag. And if I needed it for something shorter, I could throw a zone. If it got windy, I could throw a captain's raptor. Right. <clears throat> well, and I saw that uh, Bill Nye is apparently into disc golf, and he knows mm -hmm. a thing or two about science. So maybe we can get him to, you know, explore that a little bit. Uh, we invited him on our podcast. So everybody start tweeting Bill Nye or, you know, hit him up on Instagram and tell him he needs to come talk to us about this. We'd love to learn more. <laughs> yeah, that'd be awesome. I'm sure he could teach us so many different things. Absolutely. I think, he, you know, my son knows who you are and he knows who some of the people are in disc golf, especially because we did a video with you before. But when I told him that I was trying to get Bill Nye on the podcast, he got really excited. So uh, <laughs> I got to earn some clout around my house. You know, that's the way it works. Uh huh. Uh, anything else new coming into the 2024 season as far as your bag goes uh, or anything changing about uh, discs or equipment, anything like that? Yeah. Um, let's see. The I was on the Wasp, uh, I believe, whenever you came down a couple of years ago. And I've I, the Wasp has been in and out of the bag throughout the past couple of years. Recently, I took the Wasp out and I put in a uh, Nebula. Oh, okay. And the Nebula is great. It is a great complement to the Buzz. I thought for the longest time, uh, watching other people throw it, that it was going to it was going to overlap the Buzz. But uh, apparently, they just had some really beat in ones. The ones I have are on the overstable side. They're almost uh, kind of similar to a Buzz OS. Okay. Uh, Buzz OS Wasp somewhere in that. Uh, area overstable but still has glide right so it's been a good compliment i throw it in the big z plastic and the uh, z plastic um the z being a decent amount more overstable than the big z so yeah uh it, it's almost pushing on the drone uh overstable slot in my bag but not quite now is the nebula technically out of production or is that uh, a disc that they're doing like specialty ledgestone runs or do you have to try and find some old ones of those? Uh, technically out of production, but they, it seems like they do one run a year, at least the past couple of years for a ledgestone run. Yeah. And uh, it, it's kind of gained popularity within the team. Ezra Adderhold throws it. I throw it now. Uh, ben Calloway. Um, and I mean, there might be a couple more that I'm overlooking, but if it continues to grow popularity, who knows, maybe it comes back out of production. Yeah. I think we saw that a couple of years ago with Chandler Fry and the, was it the surge? Yep. That kind of made a little comeback, a, a surge back into the, into production. <laughs> yep. <laughs> nice. Well, Hey, if anybody out there wants to see the nebula as well, there's already a few people throwing it. Let, let this craft know. Yep. A lot of shout outs for Twitter today. Totally unintentional. Uh, but I guess, you know, tweet at tweet at the people you need to make things happen. Uh, I, I want to move on and talk a little bit about maybe just something that sort of obviously affects you a lot on a weekly basis at on the tour, and that's rules. Uh, this is kind of a typical off-season discussion point where people are talking about things that are changing. The PDGA maybe pushes new ideas, and then the next year maybe rolls them back after people aren't super excited about them. Uh-huh. Um, so moving into 2024, the PDJ announced that all players in a group must keep score. Uh, that was one big change. Casual obstacles behind your lie can be moved, which is kind of rolling back a change that was, I guess, maybe a little misunderstood, uh, this past year. Yep. 
uh, are a little ambiguous. And then uh, there's also several updates ru to rules related to pace of play, player misconduct, and um, and a plenty of others. What do you make of some of those changes heading into the new season? So uh, I think the two biggest ones are the first two that you started out with, the scorecard for everyone on the, in the group and uh, being able to move obstacles, you said, behind your lie. That's correct. So th the actual language is slightly different, but if, effectively what it's saying is if it's further from the basket than where your lie is. So if it, I, the way that sounds to me is behind your lie, okay. which sounds a lot like how uh, it was before. Correct. Uh, before, uh, what, what I'm wondering if, uh, if they change the rule back now to, it used to be if it extended in front of your lie, right. you could still move it as long as it was in your lie. Uh, is that still kind of how the the rule is worded, or is it only if it's completely behind your lie? That is a great question. Let's pull it up and see, because <laughs> I did look at it. Uh, okay, moving obstacles. This greatly broadens the area in which players may move casual obstacles. The change responds to requests from players that the rules grant the ability to clear casual obstacles from a larger area to accommodate a run-up. So the updated language is a player may move casual obstacles that are on the playing surface farther from the target than the front edge of the lie. Farther from the target than the front edge of the lie. So yeah. not if it extends in front. That's right. <laughs> is that is that how you're reading it? So I guess yeah, I don't I don't know how that would factor into if it extends in front of your lie, but if it's I guess it says yeah. if it's farther from the target than the front edge of your lie. So behind, if it's a, away from the target, behind your lie, and it's an obstacle, I, I don't know if that would apply to something in your way uh, or if that's actually in front of you, but that's a good question. Right. Still sort of ambiguous. Yeah, but, <laughs> yeah because uh, it, it doesn't happen too, too often, but every now and then, you know, uh, there'll be a limb or something that falls on the course, yeah. and, you know, in between. If it happens during a round, if it happens before people get out there for a round, there's nothing you can really do about it. Um, but eventually a shot's going to find that if it's in the fairway, even if it's not in the fairway. Oh, yeah. A shot's going to find that. So then that's where the question comes in. Like I threw into this brush pile, M maybe not a brush pile, but a, a pretty big limb that fell out of the tree. So since I'm in this and it extends in front of my life, can I move this or do I just have to play it how it is? Yeah. And I think that's, this sort of brings up another question too, where obviously then in that position, it's up to you and your group to make that call. Maybe you can bring in the TD to help make that call. How long do we think that, especially professional disc golf with now cameras everywhere, analyzing every aspect of that can we go on with players having to sort of self-officiate like you know is there is there any other way that that could be approached what do you think of that um i want to say the maybe not best case but a, a pretty good case would be to have a marshal on every single card yeah. so i think what that looks like is having 20 people or a couple more that have passed uh, a rules exam that's maybe a little bit more uh, strenuous than the, the players' <laughs> rules. Yeah, uh, or even the current, like, TD exam is is fairly simple. Right. So just have an exam that's a little bit harder than the rest. Um, that way, you know, you should have all the rules covered. And instead of having just 18 people, because, you know, backups are going to happen on the course, people are going to start to pile up, and then you run out of people – uh, or marshals to put on cards. So if you have a few extra, and I know you're going to have to pay these people because they're not going to be volunteers. Sure. Um, and I, I know it. The more I talk, it's less and less possible. But in a perfect <laughs> world, if you yeah, had a yeah. marshal on every single card, it would eliminate this. Um, just because if you had someone there who knows the rules to a T, you ask them a question. They give you an answer, whether that answer is yes or no, and then you proceed. Yeah. So, I don't know. Um, now, even a bigger if. If every single player knew every single rule, we wouldn't need the marshals. Yeah, true. But whenever you factor in more people, um, 
you know, the possibility of not knowing or having different opinions on how the rule reads and stuff like that uh, comes into effect. So, well, I just think about how difficult some of those conversations likely become when the stakes get higher and higher, when there's more and more, you know, money or reputation on the line as the sport grows. You know, I, I sort of you watch like a professional soccer game, which is the example I use because I've watched soccer and I would not want soccer players refereeing each other because uh, they clearly <laughs> have a pretty strong bias towards uh, it went out on the other team, you know, every time the ball goes out. So, um, you know, I think it does create difficult situations, but you're right. It, it sounds like that would be a difficult thing to implement right now. But, you know, I'd, I'd like to think as the sport grows, that is certainly something that could be attainable. Right. Yeah. Uh, as of now, you know, we're self-governing for the most part. And let's say let's say someone is taking too long on their time or something like that. The rest of the group is less likely to call that if it's on hole two or so, because it throws off the entire um I guess vibe, vibe of the card, because, you know, not everybody, and it depends on what kind of day they're having too. You know, if they're not having a great day, they may see it as you're picking on me or yeah. whatever, but nobody's going to be happy about getting called for a rules violation, whether it's a foot fault or a time violation or anything else. But if someone inside the group, another player has to make that call, um, you know, it could create some tension between those two players or even the entire group. Um, and I've seen that happen before, but I've also seen it happen the other way. Uh, somebody's got called for a rules violation. They took it. They said, you know what, that's on me. And we've moved on. Yeah. yeah. Um, I've also seen it called from either a, a marshal or someone who is able to make the call that is not part of the, you know, four players on the, in the group. Um, and, when that happened, it didn't create any kind of atmosphere on the card. Um, right. So I think that would be best case scenario, uh, just so it doesn't affect you know anybody on the card, um, not just the other three who aren't getting called for the rules violation, but every single person on the card. So, yeah, I think moving it out of our hands and into um, – a marshal or someone like that, I think that would be best case. It really is one of the more interesting aspects of professional disc golf being self-governed that creates uh, those situations that, or, or, or and disc golf being such a mental game and how easily mm -hmm. that, you know, focus can be taken away by having to, <sighs> you know, essentially call a penalty on your competitor. You know, even though you're right. you are all playing against the course, you know, if they're on your card and you know how well they're doing, their score matters to you as well. And how, mm -hmm. you know, that that atmosphere is affecting each player on that card differently. Right. Tricky. Very uh very interesting. Well, uh we'll leave the rules debate there and uh you know or well actually I, I guess I have one more question. Um in okay. in that sort of space, maybe not rules specific, but you've been uh on the pro tour for some time, you've been around that level of the sport. I'm curious, uh I think it's always easier from the outside looking in, but if you had the power, if somebody were to say, Chris, you're in charge tomorrow of whether it's you know the Pro Tour or the PDGA, is there one specific thing that you would want to change or implement to make some type of improvement? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, let's see. You know, the first thing that pops into my head, uh, I would love to start playing disc golf courses again instead of playing these temp courses on golf courses, um, because. You know, you, you can create a, a couple of holes that are signature holes on a golf course, but then they start to look pretty similar from one to the next. Right. Uh, and I do believe there there are a lot more injuries within the past year or two um, than before, and I think that sprouts from having these longer courses consistently and having to throw so hard on every hole or every other hole. Um, 
you know, it's just going to wear down your body eventually. I've yeah. seen people wearing knee braces. I've worn ankle braces. Uh, people have worn like the elbow braces and whatever else. Um, a lot more than I've, I have seen. And, you know, I'm not saying completely do away f- with it. It's good to have a, a good mix. Um, sure. Golf courses are great. If you, if you took, let's say, there's 10 events throughout the year, and five of them were golf courses, five of them were disc golf courses, even if they were a mixture, a range of 10,000 feet to 5,000 feet, have a pitch and putt thrown in there sometime. But if you alternated one and one for 10 events, I think that you know the players would like it more and maybe even the fans would like it more. Um, I think I saw Simon posted about getting feedback uh, about what the fans wanted to see, what kind of courses they like. And I believe his feedback was a disc golf course around a par 60 or 62. And I yeah. can't remember if there was a footage or not, but it seemed like um, a wooded wooded course, not really short, but not really long. And then somewhere around a par 60 to 62. Well, and I like what you said about seeing or well i don't like i don't like hearing about more injuries but i do think that that's a really good point in in pushing top level athletes to their limit you know obviously it's great to be able to watch distance throwers throw as absolutely as far as they can you know on a course like the preserve even that you know Uh used to be a golf course but now has you know been slowly uh focusing on disc golf there are still holes that are you know 1200 feet or something like that you know par fives and having to throw max power shots two, three times in a row does take its toll. So I, 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 it would seem like there's got to be some attention given to that if we want to continue to be able to see the best players compete week in, week out. Um, and I guess there's – this sort of leads into the next topic I want to talk about, which is the 2024 season. We've seen a few changes there in the schedule – uh, we're not starting in Las Vegas this year. We're starting at the Florida Open, uh, which I know is mm-hmm. your first event of the year uh, after the All Star event, correct? Mm-hmm. And um, in that in that sort of vein, it also seems like there's a little bit less in terms of the volume of events from some of the more recent seasons. And even going back and looking at like your own PDGA statistics, it looks like the number of events that you're playing per year has come down. Uh, you know, overall, but obviously those events are now kind of bigger and and larger and maybe even longer in terms of the number of days uh, being pro tours or majors. So, um, you know, how do you view that change in terms of the number of events? Are we actually seeing a little bit less, but maybe higher quality events? Or uh, could that have an impact to a certain extent on like player burnout? Yeah, I believe so. Um, I think... I think there are less events this year, but uh, I think exactly what you said, less events, but higher quality of events where um, the year before last, they were still doing the, the elite series and then silver series, right. which were supposed to be, um, you know, smaller events. They were supposed to be test events for the pro tour. But what it seemed like was, um, Basically, they were on the way to the next event anyway, or they were a short detour, and the whole field went there. Yeah, it's hard to pass uh, up if it just happened to be on the way. Right, because, I mean, you know, we all want to play disc golf anyway, and there's a <laughs> tournament on the way to the next one. We might as well stop. Um, so, yeah, it was basically a, an A tier with uh, most of the Pro Tour, if not all of the Pro Tour field. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that year, I want to say that was 2022. Um, you know, there there were so many events because those Silver Series turned into, you know, just an, another event. And then they they got rid of those. They called them all Elite Series. And I think I don't know what the number is, but I'm pretty sure it dropped from last year to this year. Yeah, it did look um, like a, a few less events overall. Uh, so yeah. I think I, I think I know the answer to my next question, given our discussion about golf courses just a moment ago. But how do you feel about the 
uh, the start of the season moving to Florida instead of the Las Vegas Challenge. And I guess, have you gone out to LVC? I played uh, Vegas once. Okay. Yeah, in 2022, I want to say I finished 12th. Um, that sounds about right. I want to say 9th, but I don't think it was 9th. I'm pretty sure it was 12th. Um, but I will say the golf courses were pretty solid. It wasn't throw it as far as you possibly can every single shot. They they had a good mix of holes, and they brought in uh, some artificial OB, some you know water and things like that to make holes interesting and push you. You know, if it's a par four, they push you to one side of the fairway or the other on some holes. Uh, but then there were some holes where you could just open up and throw it as far as you wanted. Um, yeah. The only negative thing I'll say about whenever I went out there was there were three courses that we played. Mm. Um, if it were two, it would have been so much better. If it was one, you know, um, it would have been pretty good, but I also don't think with one course that we would have gotten to see the um, how different the layouts were. Right. Is the, is the issue with three courses about being able to practice and prepare to play three courses? Yes. So uh, I would feel comfortable showing up to a, an event if I was playing one course three days before. Uh, that way I could get at least three practice rounds in and kind of know what discs I need to throw where. Yeah. Um, with... With two courses, I'm going to say a minimum of four days. That way you could get each course in twice. And, you know, you're still going to be throwing quite a few shots every day. Um, for example, whenever we go to uh, Smuggler's Notch in Vermont, mm -hmm. those courses are decently long, but they're short enough. If I finish one and it was early in the day... I could take a break and I could come back out in the evening and I could play the whole other course. Or if I just wanted to, I could play nine holes. Um, yeah. So it, it depends on the course, but I think for two uh, courses uh, at an event, uh, four days would be as little practice as I could possibly uh, need. But I, I wouldn't feel comfortable with anything less than, you know, four days. So then, you know, uh, moving into three courses, you, you get up five days, six days. So it, it, you run out of time and, yeah. you know, you're, you're spending, the longer that you're there, you're spending money those extra days. Um, so if you go from, you know, two days, three days before the event, that's three days worth of expenses if there's three courses, you six days worth of expenses before the tournament gets there. Right. So it's just, it, it just weighs, you know, you weigh your odds or your, uh, whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I, I guess there's a lot, there's a lot to consider and I'm, I'm glad you bring up expenses. I reached out to our discord server, uh, to ask folks what sort of questions they would have for you, uh, about, you know, all aspects of being a professional disc golfer. And one topic that kept coming up was expenses. Uh, at the same time, figuring out how to ask someone about expenses without being like, tell me about your bills uh, is difficult. So I guess I'm curious, what do you find as the, the what's driving, I guess, the majority of the cost of being on tour? Is it gas? Is it vehicle maintenance? Is it, you know, the lodging when you get to a location? Um, is there anything specific that stands out? Um, yes. So, uh, with my deal with Discraft, we worked out, uh, that they cover, you know, um, uh, a decent amount of that. So nice for me, uh, once I get to a place, um, lodging, uh, gas driving around town while we're there food and whatever else, um, grocery stuff like that. 
And unless I'm forgetting anything else, um, that's pretty much it. Uh, yeah, you know, it, it doesn't seem like a lot, but it, it adds up. Well, it adds up quickly, too, when there's more than one of you traveling, because Brittany's usually with you out on tour as well. And are you guys are you guys driving to most events, or are you flying out to anything? Or <clears throat> Last year, the only thing that I flew to – actually, I take that back. Flew to two things. Flew to the All-Star event at the beginning of the year, and then we both flew to uh, European Open. Yeah. Um, so besides those two, we uh, drove our RV – um, everywhere else. Still on the topic of 2024, and we're kind of bouncing around a little bit. Uh, I was doing a little bit of research, and 2024 is going to be the 10th year that you've competed in MPO. And the majority of those 10 years, you've, of course, uh, spent your time kind of traveling around, whether it was the national tour, pro tour, or like regional events uh, near Tennessee, North Carolina, kind of in that neighborhood. Um, as you... Uh, approach a new season, which you've now done plenty of times, do you set any specific goals for yourself? Do you have like certain uh, targets or you're thinking about certain events where you maybe have a better chance at, you know, a particular type of course, you know, what's in your mind as you're sort of preparing for the season? Right now, um, I'm just excited to get out there and compete again because like I said, I, I feel like I've worked pretty hard this off season, and I, I just can't wait to get back out there and actually, you know, put it to the test. Maybe the the end of twenty twenty three left a little sour taste in your mouth, right? Looking to clear that out. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and I've had to sit with it all off season. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I'm excited. I can't wait for the All Star event and for the first uh, event of the year at the. Let's see. I've been corrected online. The chess.com open. Um, yes. Instead of instead of the Florida open. Excuse me. I don't want to be upsetting sponsors. <laughs> Can't have that. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> well, Chris, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. I have just a couple more questions to wrap up with here. Um, you've achieved some really incredible things already in your career. You're a U.S. champion, two-time Pro Tour champion, uh, multiple time major winner. What motivates you at this point? You know, I, I hear you talking about that, like excitement to get out and compete again. What keeps you motivated to continue to compete at that highest level? Just, just the competitive drive, honestly. Um, this whole off season, I've been thinking I need to get out there and do better than I did the year before. And, um, you know, I think every time I come off of the disc golf course, that's kind of my, my mindset is the next time I go to a disc golf course, I need to do better than I did the previous time. And, you know, sometimes that's not going to happen. Uh, you're going to have bad yeah. days or you're going to have the day before was so great. It's going to be really hard to top that, but Going into every single round, I want to do better than the previous round. So, yeah, just just the drive to do better, and um, yeah, see see where that takes me. Is that competitive spirit something that you're born with, or is that something that you can kind of, you know, dr make that drive for yourself? I I kind of wonder about that sometimes. Like I, you know, I meet people, they're hyper competitive about everything they do. I got to I got when I'm driving, I got to get there first when I'm, you know, playing board games. It's not, it's not fun in games. It's about winning. Um, is that something that you always had or something that sort of maybe grew as you realized your potential in a sport like this goal? For me, it's something I've always had. Um, for example, there was a few days ago, uh, me and my wife were playing a board game, just one-on-one. -on -one. And uh, she won the series, I want to say, out of three, either three or five, whatever it was. She won, won the series, and I remember getting up and uh, calling her a sore winner <laughs> and uh, stuff like that. So it, I, I've always had the uh, competitive drive, whether it's you know competing on the Disco Pro Tour or anything, shooting basketball with yeah. uh, just a pickup game. 
always competing, cards competing, whatever it is. Um, yeah, it, it's it's difficult for me. I wouldn't say it's difficult. There's a time and a place for everything, but but to let someone else win, um, just to step aside and let someone else win, it's it's difficult. <laughs> well, we know you won't be out there stepping aside, letting anybody win this season. Um, my last question is maybe just a little more looking ahead. You know, we talked about how stiff the competition was this past season. Uh, the field seems to continue to improve every year and that competition at the top, tougher and tougher. Uh, oh. you're 31, you're still competing at that highest level. You had huge success, uh, in 2022, and I'm sure you've got plenty of years left to make that happen as well. But have you thought about what's next? Um, when you get to a point maybe where you can't compete at that level anymore, what is Chris Dickerson thinking about doing, you know, beyond the disc golf pro tour, uh, hiding out in a, in a cabin in Tennessee or what do you think? Maybe, uh, <laughs> I mean, I would love to have enough in a retirement savings to, to be able to do that after I get done playing disc golf. But, uh, Oh, first thing, uh, 30 years old. instead. Of oh, 31. excuse me. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Big difference. No. Um, it's cool. I got yeah, six I, years I, on you. <laughs> I've thought about that. Um, you know, what what disc golf could look like after um, I'm done playing. And honestly, it's – I had this discussion with my trainer um, a few days ago. And honestly, it's, it's kind of scary. Yeah. Because I can't see myself doing anything besides this. Um, so, and you know, for, for athletes that compete at whatever level, whenever it comes time, whether your body has just had enough or mentally you've had enough, um, no matter what it is, it's gotta be tough to just say, I'm done. I mean, look at Tom Brady. He said he's done and they came back because <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he didn't have enough, um, and same thing with Michael Jordan, and I'm sure there's been more, but um, yeah. But whenever that time comes, I've thought about course design. I've thought about helping people with um, learning disc golf, whether it be your form, your mindset, whatever it is. Um, I've done that a little bit in the past. Uh, I've I've done a little bit of course design. I started a project this off season and I really like the way that uh, a local course has started to take shape. So we'll see what that looks like when it's completely finished. And, you know, who knows, maybe, maybe I do a little bit more of that in the future. Um, but I believe as long as you stay healthy, you keep your body in shape, who knows how long somebody could play professional disc golf. I mean, you know, the, the best example I see right now is Johnny McRae. Yeah, yeah. He's, I don't know how old he is. I want to say he's somewhere in his 50s. Well, I'm not going to Google it because Google was wrong about you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's funny. But, I mean, I don't know. Johnny Johnny's an inspiration for yeah. uh, disc golfers, you know, looking at he's he's always had a great career uh as long as i've been in the disc golf scene he he's come back from a heart attack yeah that's incredible he is still winning he's still winning a tiers um i saw one recently down in florida he beat a pretty good field yeah and you know that that's great that's great for a sport that's even better for him um yeah. Well, and but, if nothing else, you have the beard game to follow in his footsteps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean maybe. I don't I don't know how long it'll actually get if I don't trim it. Maybe, you know, maybe I don't shave before the All-Star event. We'll see what happens, but There you go. There you go. <laughs> I don't I don't think it's going to happen. Well, Chris, we can't wait to see what you get up to this season and beyond. I wish you the best of luck on the tour this year, and it was great getting a chance to catch up with you. So thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Everybody, make sure you check out Chris. Follow him on Instagram. 
uh, all across the Pro Tour this year. Make sure you go, go watch his updated In the Bag, which should be dropping any day now, probably already by the time this comes out. Uh, and congrats on everything you got going on. Good luck this season. Thank you. I hope you all enjoyed this episode of All Six Sides. Thanks again to Chris Dickerson for joining us. Who would you like to see on a future episode? Leave a comment down below. For Six Sided Discs, I'm Greg. We'll see you in the next one. If you like this content and want to see more, please consider liking the video, subscribing to our channel, or supporting us on Patreon. Your support makes this content possible.